So welcome future addiction counselors, I hope, because we really need you all, believe me. Uh, there's such a problem out there, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, we're all involved here, we're all doing, giving back to the program. And uh, like she said, my name is Bill. I've been around, just a little background so you know who, where I'm coming from. 25 years in Aranon, uh, family member, child, on drugs, way back in the 80s. And uh, uh, for today, she's in sobriety, and I pray every day, that's when I get up every day, that they'll stay that way. As you probably all know, it's a lifetime illness, right? So, uh, but I, somewhere along the line, said I was going to get back to the program. And I've been doing that amongst everything else that I do, and working, and whatever. Um, but in Mercer County, we're very fortunate in the past year or two, we now have about 11 meetings in this area for Naranon. So it's reaching out to every day of the week, daytime, weekends, uh, and it's bringing out people all over. And how we tie into all that is with the City of Angels that they're, myself and Tom and Allison are involved in. One of our counselors in Hamilton Township uh, worked with the mayor and the other politicians. They, they turned over an old school. She turned it over for addiction, which has never happened before. It was my dream for years that we could have a place that we can meet. And it has totally turned everything else around because they're doing interventions every day. Tom does interventions. And um, in the past year and a half, two years, I think we had probably about 300, 400 interventions done in the town of Hamilton, which is fantastic. And with that, they, the parents come to Naranon. So it's really, really working well. So, other than that, about 25 years ago, I modified a hotline for the family members of Naranon in the state of New Jersey. And uh, prior to all that, all we had was hotlines for NA, AA, not for the family members. So they never really got to see what was going on with the family. Without talking to the parents, we really never knew why nothing was working. What were the family members doing? How were they enabling uh, their loved ones? Uh, so, phone calls come in continuously. We have somebody in every one of the 21 counties in New Jersey helping me on the hotline. And uh, I probably had about six or 7,000 phone calls in the past 25 years or something like that. So that's my background. It's not a brag, but it's just where I'm coming from. And I take a lot of statistics as to what the trend is, uh, what happens in the families. And basically all the time, I'm not smart. It's the same problem. It's the same disease. Uh, and they have the same problem, even though they may be in denial, and that's what Naranon helps them to get out of the denial. Their codependency is the big problem. All family members become very codependent and uh, don't realize what's happening around. Genetic problem, it's in the family, and we don't see it. Even when it comes time when they're taking pot and alcohol around 12, 13, 14, we think it's pure problems, they're doing the right thing, the other kids are doing it. But we never think to ourselves that past generations have had addiction in the family. <coughs> and um, we minimize the problem to be able to deal with it, is what we do. So, and it moves very rapidly in the teen years, from 12 to 13 to 14 puberty. By 18 to 22, they're on the hard stuff. Oxycontin, heroin, whatever you want to call it. Right? And that's when the parents wake up. 75% of those phone calls I got are parents unbelievable between 18 and 22 the children are. Uh, naturally they panic. First of all, they become 18 years old, they're of legal age. Now they can tell the parents to shove it. You, know, you can't do a thing because unless they sign, you can't find out what they're doing or not doing. So, unfortunately, we're, groups like the City of Angels, we're working a lot of the schools in Hamilton Township and we're trying to get into the schools to educate the parents, if they see their children on pot or whatever, to come forward, don't be embarrassed, and if you know you have addiction in the family, come to the counselors uh, and talk to them. But it's all this embarrassment that holds us all back. We won't tell anybody. If we tell anybody the child's going to be thrown out of school, they're going to be behind the other kids, they're not going to be in the same grades anymore because they went to a rehab or whatever transpired. So we're trying to educate the public to Get to them when they're young. Middle schools, basically, is what we're, we're heading for.
If we can reach the children around 12, 13, 14 years old, 15, 16, that, that range, the recovery rate is much higher, much, much higher. And um, so, unfortunately, I wish I had known what my child, we just didn't see it. And by the time we woke up, she was 21 years old and then she was way into her addiction. So, um, so with all that, um, so anyway, on the phone call, they come in and I finally tell them, you know, do you realize this is a genetic problem, it's an illness, it's a physical, mental problem. It's a child with low self-esteem, uh, it's one of the main culprits for the addiction. Until they can build up their self-esteem, they don't come off of drugs. And one of the best places for acquiring self-esteem is in an inpatient rehab. Because most of the counselors are addicts in sobriety, they know exactly what that person needs. They know if that child has to go to one month, two months, three months, whatever the, they can get into the rehab, then a halfway house, a recovery house, they're all important tools to give that person self-esteem to feel good about themselves. If they come out with no self-esteem, they're drying up as far as the physical part is, then they're going to go right back to where they were before because they're feeling bad about themselves and they're not able to move ahead in society. So, um, so the goal is to realize that the you're not guilty, you didn't do anything wrong to the child, you didn't cause the problem. A lot of them are say, oh, we divorced. That's why the child's like that. It's all our fault because we divorced. And the child's rebelling, that's why they're taking drugs. Or somebody died in the family, or some other serious thing happened. I said, it's just like any other illness. That didn't cause the illness. They just can't cope with it because they have low self-esteem. It's the problem. And um, so they kind of start understanding. Some of them want to deny that there's any addiction in the family. That's a big culprit. They don't want to admit that they have addiction in the family. And by the time the conversation's over, they'll usually come forward. And a lot of times they'll say to them, do you have alcohols in the family? Oh yeah, we've got alcohols in the family, but that's not a drug. Because you could buy that, that's just a drug, it's alcohol. <laughs> so I said, well, alcohol's on the same list with heroin and all the Oxycontins and whatever. So those old time family members that couldn't buy hardcore drugs, they bought more and more bottles, that's all they could afford back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, they would be doing the same thing as your child's doing if they were in this generation today. And alcohol is just as bad as any of the other drugs, depending on how much they're using and how much dysfunction they cause, and that type of stuff. So then they, now they realize that there is addiction in the family, the child does have a problem, and like I said, they're usually around 18 to 22 when they initially call. I mean, I have a lot of ones that call their 30s, 40s, whatever. But uh, I said, have they ever been in the rehab? That's the next question. Well, no, because they won't go. I said, well, have you tried to get tough and have you tried to back off and uh, not keep it enabling them? But they're going to die. That's, you can't do that. They're going to die if I do that. So I says, well, they're going to die if they stay on drugs. So the way we look at it in Naranon is that if you don't finally make that move for recovery, then there's not going to be enough hope because as they progress into their 20s and 30s, they don't live a lot, they don't have a long life being on drugs. And it's well worth it to try to get tough, go to Naranon, learn how to be tough. That's where we, it's amazing what, we, what happens in Naranon, and Allison could talk to me on that one. Um, person turns around completely. When they're with other people, they start realizing what they were doing wrong. And if you're by yourself in the house hiding from this horrible disease, you're never going to let go of this, this, this loved one of yours, because love overrules everything. No matter what your children do, you might get mad, but you're going to still love them just as much as you did any other child. Like I said, on the hotline, this person's talking to me. They see the light goes off, and now the next problem is with a child, I mean, there's other issues with spouses and significant others and all that. But with a child, it's a major problem. It's very hard to get the, the husband and wife to agree on the same thing at the same time. And that's where all the problems come in, because then the addict gets in between the marriage. They know who the weaker is of the two. And whoever's the weaker, that's the one they go to, to manipulate one way or the other. So we got to, in Darano, we try to get the parents to come so they can come together and do all their fighting when the addict's not around and agree 100% on what their decision is. They should write a contract in their house that they can handle what the rules are in the house. 
Uh, and if one's doing one contract and the other one's doing the other, it's never going to work because that addict just loves to get in between that marriage and figure out who they can manipulate to acquire the drugs that they need to acquire, however they do it. So, um, but we try to bring them together, it does, does work, and uh, it's better because now the addict can't, where are they going to go? They're both 100% on their agreements. The contract's posted in the house, this is the rules of the house, or out the door. This is what basically has to happen. You do have to get tough and save their life. I mean, it sounds cruel to tell somebody to leave the house, but if nothing else is working, you want to try to save that in person, right? So, um, and it's a good thing, you know. But if you're not coming to meetings, uh, you're not going to be reinforced. You're going to slip. After one week of not coming to the meeting, you're back to where you were before. You know, love starts taking over again. I have this beautiful child that's still my child, no matter what they're doing. And I'm going to start, I'm going to protect him so he doesn't die. And what they're doing is giving out dysfunctional love. It's really not helping that person. It's really dysfunctional love. And you have to come up with a constructive love that's going to help them. Even though it sounds cruel, that's the type of love. Next thing we ask them to do is look at this here, the next sheet, do you need narrow down? And there's a lot of questions that, that um, if you just glance over them, as you can see, uh, do you find yourself making excuses, lying, covering up for your addict? Number one thing that we all do. We try everything to, to cover up and hide what, what this child or spouse is doing. Do you have a reason not to trust the addict in your life? Well, naturally, by the time they get this packet, they have a million and one reasons why not to trust them, because everything has gone wrong. Is it becoming difficult for you to believe his or her explanations? Well, there's a tendency that they lie all the time. In fact, they make a statement in the groups. When their lips are moving, they're lying like hell, period. That's basically where they're at at that point. And um, do you lie awake worrying about the addict in all, all night, and that's what happens. It's like a tape recording going off. This keeps on banging against your head. What's going on? Where are they? What's, what are they doing? That type of thing. Uh, are they missing school? Missing work? Uh, are all their savings disappearing? If it's a marriage, unanswered questions. Uh, are you asking yourself what's wrong? Is it my fault? You start blaming yourself, you think it's your fault, you did the, you caused the problem. Why is this person on drugs? Um, becoming hostile and violent, that happens with some of the addicts, which is really a nightmare because the police start getting involved. And uh, that's the next, if you wait too long, then you're involved with all the, the court hearings. Um, police uh, are in and out of the house all the time being called and lots of lawyers, a lot of expense, and you have to learn how to back off. When do I back off and not pay for a lawyer anymore? When do they become their own adult and, and uh, go out and take care of their own problem? Because if they don't feel their pain, they're never going to move ahead. If they know their mother and father is going to pick them up, they go, what the heck? I like these drugs, I'm going to keep on taking them. My mommy and daddy are going to pick me up, so what the hell? Keep on doing it, right? Somebody's always helping you and doing everything for you. How are you going to grow? Can't possibly grow. So the same thing with addiction. So, in getting back to the folder that I gave you, there's things like personal bill of rights. Uh, there's a whole bunch of questions on it. I have the right to ask what I want. I have the right to say no to the request or demands I can't meet. You know, these are all our rights as parents. We have, have the right to do these things. We don't have to fall into this trap to let the addict control our whole lives. We're the parents, not, not the addict. Uh, then there's a parent bill of rights, also, it's very similar. And then it has everything about codependency, this one sheet if you looked at it. What codependency is and what you're doing wrong. What the addict's doing on one side and what we're doing on the other side. So you just want to look at all of these things. Do's and don'ts, these are good. Uh, what are the right things, what are the wrong things to do, right? And, um, then there's a wonderful open letter to the family from the drug abuser. You might want to look over that.